So uh, I'll be telling you this morning about a long-term silvicultural study uh, that we've had in place on the west side of Mount Mansfield. It is called the Vermont Forest Ecosystem Management Demonstration Project. It was a, a really early BMC project, and actually it is uh, established on a, a large research area that um, uh, basically it, it was uh, sort of uh, provided by the state of the Mount Man Mansfield State Forest to the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative for their use, and so that's where our study's in place. So the study is a complex one, and I've reported on it uh, a number of times at these BMC meetings previously. To make a very, very long story short, the fundamental objective of this study is to test silvicultural approaches that we might use to manage for late successional and old growth forest characteristics and manage forests. So, uh, things that we can do to increase the structural complexity of our managed forests. And then we're comparing some of these alternative silvicultural approaches against some more conventional selection harvesting systems like single tree selection and group selection. Uh, previously, we've reported on carbon responses, biodiversity responses, stand dynamics, and even the economics. Um, but today, we'll talk very specifically about tree regeneration which of course is a fundamentally important uh, variable in any kind of silvicultural system. All of these objectives, biodiversity, economic timber, watershed functioning, they all depend on successful tree regeneration. So it's a very important thing for us to look at. Okay, so just real briefly to set up some of the silviculture in the study, the system that we're testing is this one here. It's called Structural Complexity Enhancement. And it's basically a whole variety of different silvicultural techniques that are used in tandem to accelerate or promote stand development processes, to try to expedite the processes that lead to the development of structurally complex forests. So things like greater representation of large trees, both living and dead, higher volumes and densities of large than we agree, greater canopy complexity, more horizontal variation in strands and stand structure, all those sorts of characteristics. And then, as I said before, we're comparing those against modified selection systems, both single tree and group selection. The conventional systems, is that coming up correctly? It's a little bit faded. The conventional systems are also modified in some ways. So for instance, we are doing things like elevating the amount of residual stand structure that is maintained. Um, with the group selection system, we've modified the scale, the size of the group selection openings to emulate fine scale natural disturbance effects. And we've done things like retain some degree of residual structure legacy trees inside some of those groups. So there's some modifications there that are of interest also. So back to tree regeneration. So uh, there are a number of managers in the, in the room, which is really great to see. So all you guys know that there's quite a bit of debate about our ability to successfully regenerate the, the more desirable from an economic and ecological standpoint, mid-tolerant and shade-tolerant species in our forests. Yellow birch, sugar maple, red maple, and on a sugar bush, those, those sorts of species. And they're really conflicting reports. There's lots of previous research on this from the Northeast, also from the upper Midwest, and now coming in from Quebec. So lots of folks looking at this, and they all find different things. Sometimes selection harvesting systems work well, other times they don't. There's been a movement, especially in Vermont, but other parts of New England in recent years, towards more aggressive harvesting techniques, patch cutting, larger openings, 
the idea being that that might shape, uh, favor sugar maple, especially where we have a real problem with beech sprouting in response to beech bark disease and other things. But th there are mixed opinions on this. They have a very different experience in Quebec where they're finding that single tree and small group selection is working just fine. So there, there, there seem to be a variety of, of things at play here. For our study, we need to know, if we're trying to promote old growth characteristics, which sort of by definition means a combination of closed canopy conditions, but also more variable light environments that you might find with, with gaps and, and other kinds of uh, openings, we need to know, can we successfully re regenerate these desirable species, some of these mid and shaped lawn species that we're interested in, and not just get prolific beech sprouts or beech staples in the other story. Okay, so the study was um, initiated in 2001, shortly after I arrived at, at UVM. Uh, the treatments were implemented in the winter of 2003, and we've had basically um, about 12 or 13 years of post-treatment data collection since then. So I'll be using data from a variety of sampling intervals after treatment. I think we've sampled eight or nine times since the initial treatment. So we're beginning to collect this, uh, or compile this fairly nice long-term record of responses. So we can really look at some of these regeneration dynamics and lag effects and interactions and some of those cool things. Okay, so um, the study design, the study is implemented at, at two main uh, research areas. The primary one is this one on the side of Mount Mansfield where we have four treatments in place, a single tree selection, group selection, structural complexity enhancement, and controls. Each of those is replicated twice in a randomized block design, and then we have a partial replication of the experiment at the Jericho Research Forest. Two controls and two more units of the structural complexity enhancement treatment. That's where the data come from. Okay, so two main research questions today. So first of all, just really simply, what were the treatment effects on regeneration? And we're interested both in density by species, but we're also interested in overall diversity. So we'll be using the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index for that. And then also, what are some other sources of variability that might interact with treatment effects? So things like herbivory, light availability, uh, substrate, and then also climate to the extent that we can look at climate variability. That's a tricky one at our scale, and, and really all we can, can look at is the Palm Drought Severity Index using gridded climate data to get some handle on precipitation and drought stress. Okay, so for those two questions, uh, we've used a variety of statistical techniques. So uh, linear uh, mixed effects models and generalized linear uh, mixed effects models. And these allow us to account for repeated measures and then also to bring in multiple sources of variability. We can add those other variables in to see how those interact with treatment effects. So that's the basic statistical design. I could say more about this later if anybody's interested. <clears throat> okay, so here's some just kind of starting data to, to get going with this. So here we have those two research areas, Jericho Research Forest and the Mount Mansfield State Forest. And then we have the different treatments, the controls. So those are unharvested, unmanipulated, group selection, structural complexity enhancement, single tree. Jericho, we have not had a tremendous treatment Response. In fact, there was very little treatment effect on regeneration. There are a number of things happening there. There's a, a much larger hemlock component, the much more shaded conditions. The control units themselves have, a, so have had some natural disturbance and some gap development there. So um, the, the experiment has not had a dramatic effect on regeneration at Jericho. So instead, I'm going to be focusing on the Lance field where we've had some really very interesting regeneration responses. And, and we're able to tease out treatment effects a little bit better. So this is just looking at total ceiling densities. And the interesting thing here is that at first there was very little response. But about four or five years after treatment, we got a really big pulse of uh, regeneration really across all the species of interest. So this initial pulse in regeneration across all of the treatments. And then, of course, the decline in those over time with seedling mortality. But then also, as you have some of those seedlings moving up into the sapling class. And of course, if you're a forester, this is what you really want, right? You want established regeneration, not just germination, but you want some of those seedlings to survive into the sapling class. So that's what we have here. So, you know, 13 years down the road, 
we have a pretty well established satin class, and actually there's no statistical difference among the treatments. So they all work pretty well at getting a class. The question, of course, is you know, what is that class of saplings, and how much of it is, is these desirable species that we would prefer both ecologically and economically? So here we've broken that out into uh, American beech and then sort of three indicators of, of those other species that we're really targeting. A couple of things to look at here. One is that there's just a tremendous range of variation across all the treatments and regardless of whether we're talking about beech or these other species. This reflects patch level spatial variation. So as you move from one patch to another patch, there's a huge variation in terms of the regeneration response, so very heterogeneous, very patchy. Across all treatments, though, the beach response is by far um, the most abundant, actually except for single tree. But in structural complexity enhancement and group selection, the beach is, is uh, the most prolific. But again, wide variation around that. And yet, we have levels of sugar maple and yellow birch regeneration here that actually exceed some of the minimum thresholds that are established by silvicultural guides, sort of like what the minimum that you would want to maintain um, stand dynamics and, and growth and yield and those kinds of things. So that's encouraging. Um, let's look at diversity as another interesting metric here. So what you see here is some very interesting lag response, responses. Across all of our treatments, there was actually an initial decline in diversity. And this might reflect things like harvesting impacts, effects of uh, mechanized harvesting, other activity, but then a recovery in diversity among all these treatments. And that actually, for the structural complexity of treatment, we're really trying to mix things up. Free, microsite heterogeneity, all those kinds of things, we actually got the largest diversity recovery over time as an absolute mean, although not statistically significant from some of the others. Something that's going to complicate my statistical results in a second and makes this whole story really messy is that there were some really strange things going on in our control units at the same time. So as a comparison against control, the statistics don't work really well. We were also seeing increases in diversity in our controls. We actually had the remnants of um, Hurricane, I think it was called Isabel, the earlier one that came through and knocked down some trees, created some gaps, kind of mixed things up on its own. Uh, our controls tended to be on some richer sites, better soils, okay? Um, so, you know, this just goes to show that Mother Nature also knows how to develop forest stands and create complexity and diversity, right? We don't always need silviculture to do that. So that was increasing here in our control units as well. Okay, but if we look at diversity then post-harvest, and let's just focus on our treatments then. As a mean, structural complexity enhancement had the highest levels of diversity 13 years after harvest. So that was really encouraging that we got this really good diversity response. Although again, the statistics are challenging here, to say. Let's bring in some of these other sources of variability though. So what else is driving that? I said that there's a lot of patch scale diversity, a lot of heterogeneity. All the foresters know this in the room. That sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So what are those other sources of variability? I mean, you can just see it when you walk through these forests. Sometimes you have these really dense beach understories, the beach hell kind of condition. At Jericho, we actually had some really nice patches of red oak regeneration, which is super encouraging. And then there are these other places on Mount Mansfield where we have this really nice sugar maple response in some of the patches. This is my structural complexity unit on Mount Mansfield, one of them. Okay, so we can look at that statistically. So here are those variables that I mentioned before. And there are a couple that really showed up as important here in our study at least. One of them was substrate. So where you had more mineral soil, I'm sorry, more litter, more fine litter on the forest floor, it definitely favored beach. So there was a more prolific beach response for litter, litter, fine litter. And um, also for browsing, we have a, a lot of deer and a lot of moose on Mount Mansfield. And the more browse, the more beach. It definitely favored beach and uh, discriminated against sugar maple. So um, this ties in with other research, especially the, the work happening in, in Quebec, that shows that selection harvesting systems can still be successful 
If you use some degree of beach control, and there are a whole variety of forms that that can take, and also if you consider scarifying the soil, and actually removing that litter to encourage sugar maple regeneration. So beach control plus scarification might give you a better maple response with a selection harvesting system. Uh, climate did show up as, a, as an important variable here. We had some mild droughts that occurred during the course of the study. And there was a, a correlation with species diversity in those structural complexity units. So that's another thing that could affect um, disproportionately the sugar maple, since they seem to be a little more sensitive to, to drought than, than our beach. And so this raises some real uh, long-term concerns, of course, in terms of climate change and future drought uh, dynamics. So we'll have to keep our eyes on that. OK, so some take-home points here, just to sum up. There was a high degree of spatial variability in the regeneration response. Prolific beach sprouting in some patches across all the treatments. And actually, I should have said this before, the greatest beach densities were actually in, the, in our large group selection openings. So the idea that big groups are going to work better for maple is not always true. It was the opposite for us. Our beach regeneration was five times higher in the group selection units than it was in the single tree and structural complexity enhancement. So there are other things going on there that you need to really pay attention to. Um, but our overall regeneration responses were sufficient for long-term sustainability objectives, especially if we consider now maybe going back in and doing some beach control. So that's probably going to be the next stage of the study, actually. Some understory thinning treatment work. But there are also multiple sources of variability to play a role here. So lots of things that we need to know to make this kind of old growth silviculture work. So it probably works better on higher productivity sites, works better where browse is less of a, of a concern, and works better where you can control some of these other sources of variability. Um, management implications, I, I'm still comfortable saying that structural complexity and management treatments can establish a new cohort of the desirable species. So for our study, it's not that it was better than traditional selection harvesting systems. It's that it was comparable, that it was sort of good enough to make this approach work under the right conditions. That's really the take home message. Um, may require beach control and scarification. I've mentioned that. Um, and with group selection, of course, which was an also, also an element of the study, you know, our, our results were really mixed. Um, we used kind of medium-sized group openings. They were an eighth of an acre on average. But it didn't work very well, so you might want to go larger or smaller with the group openings to, to deal with the beach problem. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my funders, EMC, SRC, and USDA National Research Initiative. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. I mean, they're, they're competing hypotheses. 
hypotheses about that. You know, the roots sprouting uh, in response to soil compaction versus beach bark disease, and it's probably a combination of both. But for us, it's definitely beach bark disease. Thanks, okay, Bill. thank you.